the whom the person whom we all remember, the person of the century, himself has suggested in a completely different context. It is called cosmological constant, and this has been my favorite in the last few years. Uh, I'm slowly converting towards that. This cosmological constant is not a material at all. It is just that the Einstein's theory can be modified by adding a term. And when you do that, it produces all these effects which you see. Every experiment known to humanity is consistent with that. And in that sense, it is very interesting. And there is an interesting history to that which I might as well tell you. Uh, when Einstein first uh, wrote down his equations of general theory of relativity, he found that this will have a model for the universe. And he wrote down the corresponding equations and solved it. Nowadays, every graduate student does it. It's not too difficult. When you solve it, you find that the universe has to expand. Now, even the great Einstein at that time hesitated because he thought that they, come on, the universe cannot expand, it has to be static. And there is no way his equations will give him a static solution, so he tweaked the equation and he added a constant. Now, when he added this constant, he made two mistakes. The first mistake he made was that uh, even after tweaking, he was not good at tweaking at all. Even after tweaking, these equations had an expanding solution and within a couple of years others showed that even with your constant, the universe will continue to expand and that uh, solution which you found is very unstable and so it doesn't really solve the problem. And the second was that nowadays experiment seems to confirm that that tweaking is actually right, that there is a cosmological constant in the universe. So later years, he is supposed to have said that this is the this is biggest blunder. But if you actually read the history, that is not what he meant at all. What he meant was that here was an opportunity for human civilization to write down an equation, solve it in a piece of paper, and predict that the universe is expanding. That would have been a great moment for human civilization. That you could just do this, the ultimate power of mathematics, that you can do this, predict that the universe is expanding, tell your colleagues to go and look for it, and they would have detected it. But he fumbled at that point and he made it static. And only afterwards, when the expansion of the universe was discovered, people said that, okay, let us throw away this cosmological constant and we'll just go back to that. So he missed that opportunity. And I, I believe that is what he meant as the, the greatest uh, brand and get committed. So what exactly is this? As I explained to you, that is technical, but let me just try to give you a flavor of that. It is a term in some mathematical equation but which in some sense acts like a matter with negative pressure. So it's not real matter, so you don't have to worry about it. And that term will take care of this acceleration and all other observation. It remains constant as the universe expands. That is understandable because it's a term in the equation, it cannot change. And while all other energy densities keep decreasing, so at some late stage in the evolution of the universe, this quantity which was dormant will start dominating the and it starts dominating the expansion of the universe somewhere in the recent past, and that is how we see this accelerating thing. In fact, at present we believe that uh, with the ideas of quantum field theory, that what we call vacuum is not completely an empty space, and there could be fluctuations in that. And these fluctuations could have energy associated with it, and which could, in fact, be the, uh, be the cosmological motion. The trouble is, no one has been able to calculate it. You know what its value is from experiment. You can put in that value. But that is a ridiculously small number. It has to be extremely fine-tuned. And you change it slightly. I mean, one part in, uh, it, it has to be fine-tuned to something like 120 decimal places, okay? So you change it at the 120 decimal places slightly. And the way universe would behave is very different. Which is weird, and nobody likes to do that sort of a thing. But so we have to understand why this cosmological constant has this kind of a behavior, and we do not quite understand it yet at all. And as as uh, as I said, the insights and the challenges are going to be mixed in this talk. And I would personally think this is the greatest challenge which is facing the cosmology today, or even theoretical physics. So that is sort of the end of the talk. And just to sum up, let me remind you what we have achieved and what we have not. First of all, we have solid experimental evidence that the universe was smaller, it was denser, and it was hotter in the past. And we perfectly well understand the evolution of the universe given this model uh, from a fraction of a microsecond to 10 million years. In fact, I have colleagues who will say that we understand it even much, much uh, earlier than that. But what I meant by this fraction of a microsecond to 10 million years is that 
laboratory tested physics can be used to understand that and that is that is a great thing. Second, there were small fluctuations in the past as predicted by theory because we have seen experimental evidence for that. And this can grow to form galaxies, etc., which we see today. So in some sense, we understand how the structure formation in the universe has taken place. Nearly 95% of the matter in the universe is in very unusual form. About a third of this, uh, what we call dark matter, is less exotic than the other. And it is made of some kind of a weakly interacting particle, which is not seen in the lab. And there are huge number of experiments which are currently in way, I mean huge meaning typically half a dozen experiments going in different groups in order to detect it in the lab. And my own feeling is that within something like 10 years we will have it in the lab. It, the evidence for it is so strong that you cannot escape that. The other two thirds is anybody's guess. The other two thirds is what I said is the dark energy, it has negative pressure. We have absolutely no clue what it is. We know experimentally that it is there. We all wish it is not there, but it is very much there, and it needs to be understood. And uh, we have we have no idea what it is. And the some point is that observational astronomy is making tremendous progress today, and the cosmology today is driven entirely by observation. And that should be the last question. Light is uh, so particle and wave. So which type of theory is by in this space? Another I can mystify this thing, and there were. There's absolutely nothing mysterious about a light behaving like a particle and as a wave. There may be some deep fundamental issues, but it doesn't prevent you from solving these equations or operating this laser, okay? Which is the quantum manifestation of the photons and as a wave as well as as particle. So there is there is no problem whatsoever when you want to apply it in cosmology. At the energy scales where you understand the physics. And we do understand the physics in the laboratory up to something like 100 TeV and you can apply it into cosmology and that is the right way to proceed. I mean, we need laboratory tested physics which we want to apply to cosmology. Sir, so one more question. I'm, I'm spread off a hearing. Sir? I'm spread off a hearing college. Now I want to solve uh, some uh, problem related to space, but I don't have proper idea about uh, biology, how to solve this type of problem like RNA, DNA, in a space. I think this goes beyond the talk and beyond me. So I think we should we should. Sir, yeah. I have another question, sir. Uh, do you be, sir? It is me here, sir. This side. Yes, go yeah. On. Yeah. Uh, so do you believe that there may be possibility of existence of waves which travel faster than light? Like Carl Sagan speculated regarding the zeta rays which advanced civilizations might be waiting or means using for communication. Do you yes. believe and if what would be the implication if it I is there? I try not to go with my beliefs. Yeah. So what I can tell you is that so far we haven't seen a single experiment yeah. whose explanation has to rely on waves which are traveling faster than light. Okay? Yeah. Now there are, I mean like the tactons which we talked about, there are theoretical possibilities yeah. and uh, they are very interesting possibilities. So there are people who explore them. But there is no experiment which we know in physics yeah. for which this explanation is required. And so I sort of go with a minimalistic philosophy that until that happens, I would not like to post like that. Okay. But if it exists, then what would happen? Yeah, but that depends on the model for that object. And the model for that object will be concretized only when there is an experimental evidence okay. with which you can match it. Otherwise, it is ideal speculation. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, actually, I should now. Um, I have only one question, question because uh, one question. Um, is, uh, well, you know, there are too many contending hands. Well, you can maybe ask him in person. Oh, sure. He'll be here for a bit. Now, um, first of all, I must thank all of you to, uh, for having come here today. Um, on a hot summer, we are being particularly pleasant. He made the effort and he did appreciate that. And of course, uh, it was a marvelous streak that you served out to us uh, today, and we hope that all of us can go back to some understanding of the excitement and the difficulty of the fundamental problems that physicists are faced with in the 2017 world. So with that, thank you very much. Thanks.